you anything about HTML. So I uh, want to uh, do a, at least an introduction on HTML and how to produce it. One of the beautiful things about HTML is this. Um, when somebody writes a beautiful phone app, you look at the app, you like it, but you cannot actually look at the code. Instead, in HTML, because of the way the web is built, if you see a web page you like or something that you like, you can always look at how it's produced on your uh, browser, right? You can always click on inspect element and learn it a little bit by, uh, by other people's examples. Now, this is, uh, you know, limited to some extent. It would not be easy to just, you know, look at the code of Gmail uh, because a lot of it uh, is uh, in JavaScript that has been minimized. That means, you, you know, they, they send it to a program that replaces all variables with as short variable names as possible. And they actually even obfuscate it to prevent you from, uh, you know, reverse engineering too much of what they're doing. Um, but still, you know, to a large extent, for the simple websites that you run across, uh, you can uh, actually look at what they are doing, okay? This is becoming a little bit harder. Once the web was very static, so they sent you a page and the page didn't change in front of you, and so you could look at the HTML. And nowadays, more and more of the page is uh, produced uh, uh, by dynamic JavaScript, so you don't see it in the in the text of the HTML, but it will be added by code running inside the web page. So it's becoming a little bit harder. But one of the advices I have is, you know, look at how look at how other pages are built. You know, that's a, that's a very nice ability that you have for the web. And now, let me bring up a moment uh, web to pi. I um, I have too many things running always on my laptop, so I never remember. Um, let me just check that this works before I um, yeah we are still up so let me share the screen um, okay so uh, by the way, uh, today I will be assigning the new homework, okay? Um, if I can pull it off, which I think will be true, um, will, uh, I will give you the following. I want you to implement a wiki software, okay, in uh, likely two homeworks. Um, the first one, you will have to uh, create, pay, uh, you know, you know, create revisions of pages as people uh, edit them and create the pages, okay? so. Uh, so look for, for it. Uh, I will give you the homework by giving you some uh, start of the implementation already um, because there are some things that are not entirely easy uh, and I want to do them for you. One of the not so easy things is that I want that you, when you write, for example, open, open, open parentheses and then you write, uh, um, uh, I don't know, like polar bear, close, 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 that this generates a reference to a page polar bear in your wiki in the proper way. So that, you know, when people display the page and then click on that, it will try to access a, in a nice way a page that you can serve to them on polar bears. Now then you have to check that you have actually a page for polar bears and give it to them, things like that, okay? But this, uh, this part of input out uh, monging, so to say, uh, I'll build it for you. But I want you to build the logic that, you know, keeps the revisions, keeps the pages, uh, tries to uh, create a new page if an old page doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, um, this is interesting to do. And just as a bit of, of perspective, so you will do it, uh, um, you will do it in two homeworks in the middle of a class. And uh, the people who are to Wikimedia, the original software, uh, actually, Media Week is called, sorry. The original software that powers Wikipedia, you know, took a much longer time. And this uh, sort of gives you a measure of how much uh, the tools for developing for the web have evolved in the meantime. No? I mean, that what once took, you know, developers a very serious effort to build the, the first big wikis, and now it's so easy actually to do. I also have to tell you that uh, there is a, already a wiki in Web2Pi that comes uh, turnkey. It's called auth.wiki, okay? You should not use it. Uh, it's also not written in an easy at all way to, uh, to, uh, to learn it. If you want to learn uh, how to code in a, in a crazy sophisticated way, you can look at the code, but it's very hard. Um, it's, uh, I think Massimo Di Piero wrote it, the author of Web2Pi. He likes to write very concisely 
and it's not easy. Uh, I mean, I have tried actually to figure out what's going on in there, but uh, but it, but the exercise for you is to build it from scratch from more, more basic elements. Okay, so I think it's a good exercise. It's not too hard actually. Um, so I uh, and the other thing that I will give it is that I won't give you a web to pi package. I will give you a repository on, on a Bitbucket that you have to check out with Git. So we will be forced to learn how how to use Git because I know that you know people do. Um, I don't know how it is called uh, in English, but you know when you pretend to listen, but you actually you know that you won't do it. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm, I'm here flapping around in various revisions. So um, HTML examples. I create a new simple app so that we can go in some place where it's fairly simple. Um, and uh, if I go now to the default. So I'm getting lost about what, which one is the, where is it? Oh, index.html. I think if I click here, I might, I don't want to pick at it. I want to actually use it. No, I, I want to view it. Um, OK, here. OK, so this is the default page, OK? Now, um, Actually, let me use Chrome with me, which I'm a little bit more familiar for these tools. OK, fine. So uh, if you want to look at the structure of the page, I think you know by now the quick way is to say inspect element, OK? And this gives you either the same or another window. Let me magnify the front. Okay. That gives you essentially a peek into the structure of the page. OK. So what is a, a generic structure of a web page? Um, so here there are some, some comments that I'm not going to bother with. OK. Then the first tag is an HTML tag that closes with a, a close HTML tag. So essentially, in HTML tags come into in two flavors. Okay, they come into. Let me give you. So let me get some scratch pad here. Um, they come into the flavor of uh, a tag. Then there is some content. Sorry, there is some content and there is a close tag. Okay, or else they. Um, they can be tags that have only ah my fingers today that have only uh, one uh, one tag that both opens and closes. Okay, so some some uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, when you want to refer to another URL, so what is a, how do you call a link in HTML? Okay, you say an a tag that contains at least an href that says uh, I don't know. Uh, a web page, okay? And then you say uh, the text, uh, this goes uh, to Google, okay? And then you close the tag, okay? Um, an example of a tag that opens and closes is image source is equal to, and then uh, da 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 dot JPEG, okay? So you give it a URL in JPEG, and then, uh, you know, you could close it. And so these are the two styles of tags, okay? And if you look at a web page, the, the first tag has to be this HTML tag, OK? And then the page is divided into two very big portions, if I just close it, OK, everything else, OK? There is HTML tag, then there is a head, and then there is a body. And then, you know, closes the HTML tag, and that's the page. So the two sections have different purposes, OK, obviously. The head contains stuff that needs to go there, um, it contains two kinds of things. It contains a bit of metadata that is often useful to social sites and search engines. Okay, and that's important if you want to make your site easier to find or you know easier to share, etc. 
but and then it contains also some declarations of files that you want to load inside your web page. Uh, a web page is built uh, essentially out of three ingredients mainly. There is the HTML of the page itself, then there is a CSS that is uh, styling instructions. It tells it, for example, you know, how the titles have to appear, how the things have to look like. We, are, we will go into that at some point, okay? But CSS is styling, and then there are script files that are written in JavaScript that give you the coding, okay? And so, if you want to, uh, if you want, you can include the, the JavaScript and the styling directly in a page. But often, a lot of this JavaScript and the styling is common to many pages, right? If you decide that your uh, titles all look yellow, say, uh, don't do that, perhaps. But, uh, but if they all look yellow, uh, you want to define into some piece of styling that you then load in all the pages, so that if you, if you change the styling, you change it in one place only, and all your pages will look different. You know, that's the idea, essentially. Um, and so it's useful to separate this CSS and this JavaScript into separate files. And so these files you load in the head. So just to give you a very quick look at what is in the, the head of, um, uh, of this Web2Py, you see there is meta application name, content HTML examples. Uh, um, uh, meta name is equal to Google site verification. And if you go with a Google webmaster tools so you get a verification id and then it serves because you can tell them a site map of your site this is all these things to make your site more searchable i don't want to go into these details because it's really you know technology changes all the time but but read about it if you want to to make a you know some site that is more searchable um there, there are a lot of these things here okay then you see this is a script so this is a javascript but it's javascript that is actually included uh, from a file. It's, the JavaScript is not given here directly, okay? So if you want to include JavaScript, you have to, you can do it in two ways. You, you either do this, script, uh, okay, and uh, your code, and then you say you end the script, okay? Or you can say script source is equal to uh, where it comes from, okay? And then you simply say script, okay? So in, the, in one case, you're including it directly in your web page, and in the other case, uh, in, the case uh, and in the other case, you load it from, a, from, um, from somewhere. You can load it uh, from uh, yourself, from your own project, or you can load it from some web repository of JavaScript. You know, it doesn't need to be loading it from your same URL uh, site. Okay, um, so these these things here instead, as you uh, these links here that I can copy to the here for clarity uh, style. You can either do style uh, write what you want to do and then close it. Okay, which sometimes I do. If, if I, it's some piece of style that I just need for that particular page and I'm, I actually don't want it to go on other pages, I might do that. But otherwise, the common thing uh, is to do something like this, okay? In, uh, and this is a way to load the JavaScript from, uh, uh, sorry, the CSS from, uh, typically from your site, okay? And, you know, when you develop for the web, one of the best uh, tricks is always to, uh, um, is always to copy what other people do, okay? So copy and uh, modify as much as you can. Uh, so do take a good look at how these things are done in the classical application, and, and then you can uh, you can change it. I don't know what this no script tag is doing here, okay? Actually, I don't know. Um, maybe I don't want to know right now. Okay, so in the head go these two types of declarations. So these declarations for search engines and they include the files that you want to include before you load the page. Now, in the body instead, you put everything that is interesting in, uh, in, your, uh, in your class, okay? And so uh, in HTML, you build using uh, various ingredients. So let me uh, bring up my editor. I use it as a scratch pad essentially today. And so, you have two, two, in, two generic in, ingredients. The rectangles are created with div and are closed with a closed div. Okay? Uh, and uh, um, regions 
of text are created with a span and they're closed with a span. So these two essentially obey very different rules in, uh, in how they are laid out on the page. So you describe the web page in HTML and then you know the browser has a layout engine that will figure out where everything goes depending on how uh, wide is your viewing window and lots of other things, right? So uh, divs look like, like rectangles. Okay, you can make them look to the user as if they might have around that corner, etc. But they internally, you know, they're a div is laid, uh, laid out as a rectangle. Instead, uh, a span is uh, the equivalence of a sentence of text. Uh, think at it. So a span can have, you know, this weird shape that text has when you highlight, uh, you know, some medium of text. You might have this, this shape like this, you know, because that's the way the text is laid out. It begins at some point in the text, it wraps around, and then it finishes. Okay, so those are the two very generic containers, and I call them very generic because per se they don't do anything. They don't come, you know, the, uh, if, if you just create a div, it's just blank space. But, it, it, but you can use it to organize the way the things are laid out, and due to styling, you can also make it look particular ways. So for example, you could cause it to be blue, red, yellow, whatever color you want, okay? So, um, so let's look at these uh, very generic uh, containers, okay? So, um, let me pop this back in so that I can see it on the side of the page. It's a little bit horrible, okay? Um, but it's the best I can do. Um, yeah, it's a bit small, everything here. Uh, let me see. Um, so, so this is the web page. And if I, you see, if I click on these various divs, it shows me on the screen to what they correspond. Okay, for example, this div here is this object here. Okay, you see it's a rectangle. And inside it has these H thingies are the headers. H1 is the bigger, H2 smaller, etc. They go up to, I don't know, I have never tried, but I think up to H6 they should exist. I don't know how many of them exist. Um, so uh, if you want to modify, you see this class, uh, you can tag elements in two ways. So, um, there is an important concept, okay? When, you, when the browser reads the web page, the people who wrote the browsers do the following. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious if you think at it, but they, they need to do the following. They parse all the HTML, they build a parse tree. I don't know, a few of you have taken compilers, I guess, but I think you know what I'm talking about. It's a tree, I mean, it's basically the tree that you see displayed when you inspect the page, you know? It has these, uh, these tags, or this tree, the tree structure of which tag is inside which other, okay? So it builds that tree, and for historical reasons, so that is called the DOM tree, D-O-M. DOM, uh, what was it? Document object model, okay, because, uh, um, and uh, uh, I, I will have occasion later when we talk about JavaScript uh, to talk about uh, the DOM. But for the moment, imagine that it's a tree in which there are these various elements. And so sometimes uh, you want to write either styling or code that says, hey, these elements, uh, you know, make them blink. Uh, great. No, actually, that's not such a great idea. But, uh, uh, but how do you refer to some elements? Okay. And so there, is some, there are two ways. You can say class is equal to um, make it blue, okay? Just as a silly example, okay? Uh, and the other way would be id is equal to, um, I don't know, um, main body, okay? So what is the difference between class and id? The class can be shared by many elements, okay? It's a tag that can be applied to many elements and will enable you to style them all at once in a single block. ID is meant to be unique. Now, you don't get whipped if you make a mistake and uh, you know you put uh, the same ID to two things, but um, unpredictable things happen. In particular, you are not guaranteed on which browsers it's the first or it's the last that will actually have that ID. Uh, you know, you lose the control. You don't know what will happen. It's not specified, and I bet actually it's different in various implementations. So the, the one about not being whipped is, is, by the way, one difference between normal programming languages and what you do on the web. Uh, in a normal programming language that you're used to, if you do something silly, or simply a typo, um, you get an error. 
But on the web, you never get an error because you know the, the browsers are designed in such a way that they don't tell the user that there is an error. They just silently try to do their best. Okay. So if you forget to close a tag, if you say, for example, a paragraph open and you forget to close it, they try to do their best to try to figure out when it should actually close. Okay. Or if you uh, if you make an error in JavaScript, the browser will not tell you that there is an error. You will be there. You say. Darn, this doesn't work. And it, it will just not work. And then you have to go here. Actually, what you would do is you go here and you will go, there is a tab called console, where you would see the output of the JavaScript, and there the error is listed. Okay? So everything is uh, fail silent, essentially. Uh, okay? Uh, uh, j just as a note. Um, and so the problem is uh, that a lot of websites trust this sort of you know, robustness of the browsers and, and actually um, use code that, that, that is broken, and they just don't care. And you know, this is done all the time. Um, for example, you know, when, you, uh, uh, when, when you make a list, it should be a bullet item, it should be list and then closed list. And you know, lots and lots of people just omit the closed list, because the browsers, when they see the next list open, the next li tag, they close the previous one. OK, and so people uh, yeah tend to write uh, this bad code, OK? So but uh, this class and idea are the two ways in which, you, in which you can refer to elements. And we can see it on the fly. For example, here, I can add, let's see if I can really do it, OK? But I can, I can pretend to add, hey, how do I edit this? Oh, here, here, this way. Class is equal to span nine, span nine make me blue. Okay, um, great. Uh, you can, uh, uh, an element can have more than one class, okay? Now, I can edit the CSS. You, you see, the, the, these, uh, unfortunately, is very small, but let me try to, but this gives me um, the list. Do I need these at the bottom or not? I probably don't. How do I get rid of it? Ag. Sorry, my finger is not precise enough. OK. Um, so the styles gives me the ability now to edit. Where is my div that I made blue? Um, it was this, this div, but where, where did it go? Sorry. Oh, here, make me blue. OK. So now I can edit. The, uh, the L style of this element, OK? I don't know if I can even invent other styles. But for example, I can say um, background color um, blue, OK? And this would style this particular element. So you can experiment with how things are styled, OK? Now, I don't believe I can uh, edit these files directly, OK? Because these are files that have been loaded these are all the style files that control how this div looks like, OK? So there is the, the style that I'm manipulating now. And then there are these other styles. This is uh, taken from bootstrap responsive mean CSS, line 9, OK? Uh, bootstrap responsive is, uh, um, is a CSS, is a styling that Web2Py is using to make the page scale gracefully. I, we can go into that detail later. But what I want to say is now, is a bunch of CSS that is loaded when you load the page. And so if you wonder how, why this div looks exactly the way it does, it, you have all the rules explained here. Okay, for example, if min height, bootstrap mean CSS at line 9 tells you that the min height is one pixel. Uh, great. Um, very interesting. Font size is 12, 14 pixels. If I change these to, I don't know, um, 64 pixels, that's what I get. Okay? So I can edit the style files. And this is extremely useful, right? Because when you want to get things to look the way you want, you can first get them the way you don't want, I mean, the default way, right? And then you can go in, you can edit the style files, and you can say, hmm, that's the way it would look nice. Maybe not this big, you know, but maybe a little bit bigger. And you know, uh, then you would uh, uh, eliminate this rule of the background color, and you can essentially modify how things look. And then, when once you are satisfied, you know, we change the this line here. So I would say 
huh, bootstrap mean CSS9, you know, this line I have to override it. I wouldn't override it in that way, but I would put somewhere else a style file. Uh, which one is mine? Is this reading any one of my, so to say, style files or not? Uh, it doesn't seem. Um, so, good question. Which style files would I have to edit if I wanted to modify these? So, let's see which file styles it loaded. I can load the page. These are all the things it tries to, uh, to load. And so, calendar, CSS, uh, a lot of these CSS files. Um, and there is... Uh, there is none for us. Oh, that's bad. So let's uh, let's add one. Yeah. Yeah, but but I want to override it in some CSS. So I want to find some uh, some some CSS I can override. Yeah. No. Well, but uh, it's, it's shared among all the apps. Web to Py dot CSS, right? Oh, because I'm looking at the HTML examples. Oh, you're right. You're quite right. So we can do that, and it's easier. Okay. So, um, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Very useful. So, uh, where were we? We were in the elements. Okay. Let's find a change that we like uh, now for real. Okay. It has to come from web2py.css. Well, I don't know, but now we have these elements styled. Um, well, this is not our styling. Okay. But there is this hello world here. And I want to give it a class and make it uh, become a, um, a, a, a different font. How would I do that? Um, I go to the code. Sorry. Uh, I, I need to open this application. Um, First, I want to look at the view, okay? So this is a view default index.html. So, ah, sorry, it's this always this bug that uh, opens, uh, uh, I want to open it with a text editor, okay? So this is the text of the web page. Tell me if the font is right or if it's uh, too small, okay? Uh, um, how did you get here? And suppose that here I want to put something like an h2 um, class is equal to uh, make uh, me blue, okay? And I want to say that uh, this title should be blue, okay? Now I close this, okay? Um, I save it, okay? I, I reload the, the page from here, for instance, so that I can see better. This title should be blue, and the title is not blue, OK? Because why is it not blue? Well, because I haven't said anything about make me blue, OK? Now I, I want to uh, uh, take uh, uh, in static CSS. So sta static, this directory, sorry for my accent, but static contains static files. Um, why are they put in some place all together? Because normally when you, uh, when you upload this in the cloud or to some server that is slightly sophisticated, uh, static files are not served like dynamic files. Dynamic files, uh, like your controllers you write, they are served each way by calling some code each and every way. Okay? Static files, so the web server knows that the client can cache them. So if it has a, a copy that is more recent than a certain amount of time that you can configure, the client will not get a new copy. It will simply be told that the copy is still valid, OK? Um, so here, you know, there, is, there are many styles. And there is also web 2 So I open it with the text editor again, because I don't know what would happen otherwise. And so this must stay. OK, fine. Wow. And, and so let's, uh, let's add a rule somewhere to it. Yeah, but I don't mind, you know. I, I think we can write it here at the bottom. Like, uh, you know, who, who cares? Um, like, uh, uh, done in class. So you know where to find it. OK? So now, I, 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 how do I refer to a class? Uh, to a class, I refer by putting a dot. And I can say, uh, make me blue. 
and I can then open and close and, and give the modifiers that I want to apply to that element, okay? And I can say, for example, uh, how I, rem I forget all these things. What is font color or simply color? I think it's simply color. Well, we can try. Uh, text color, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I would, it's documented, but this works, okay? So this is now blue, and uh, the other thing I can do is that uh, this is, that is now blue, and if I put here class is equal to make me blue, okay? If I put it in another place, uh, that thing also will become blue because the style element, as I defined, it applies to everything that is associated with that class, okay? But there is a, a, a whole way in which you can, uh, you can refer to, um, to elements of the page. And, and this is called the, the, uh, the selection. We will do it better when we talk about JavaScript and CSS. But, uh, uh, but a quick trick we, uh, I can t teach you is this. For example, um, I can say h4 dot make me blue. And this will refer only to the element, to the tags h4 that are of class make me blue. Okay, not to all of them. So there is a certain language. Dot essentially means, uh, a, a dot class means everything with that class, but you can attach it to, to a tag. If I, you know, if I say h4, at the beginning of this file, they give, gave something like this, h4. So this applies to all the elements of, uh, to all the tags h4, in, regardless of their class, okay? And then you can compose the things. So for example, this uh, uh, applies to all the elements of class hidden. Um, and so on and so forth. And we can write rules. For example, these will uh, only uh, apply to the H4 that are make me blue, okay? And we can say that color is red, just to contrast, okay? So if I do these and I reload the page, that will become red, okay? So now you may, might be there thinking, you know, hey, look at it. Uh, that H4 make me blue is satisfy both rules. It satisfies this one because it has class make me blue, and it satisfies this one because it has class H4 make me blue. Um, which one will apply? And uh, the rules are incredibly complex and smoky, and this is why it's so very nice uh, that, uh, uh, that Chrome uh, tells you actually which rules apply and which ones are overridden. If you look in Chrome, you see that some rules have, are crossed out. They are crossed out because they are overridden by some other declaration. You know, this WebKit box sizing that is found in Bootstrap Responsive has been overridden. By what? Um, I don't know, but by something. It, so maybe it's not supported by the browser, I don't know. But for example, this width is being overridden. Why? Because it's being overridden by that, okay? So there is a, there is a, a complicated set of rules uh, that tells you essentially what takes the precedence. The simple of it is easy to remember. Basically, the more specific the rule, to the fewer things it applies, it will take the precedence. So that's the basic idea, and it's very simple. The rules to break ties are so complicated that some people know them, but certainly not me. Okay, I, I mean, I have to look them up if it's needed, but they are really complicated. It's like reading a legal contract. And I, uh, it's a very, and, and so uh, I have to admit what I do a lot of times uh, um, is I use the experimental approach in which I try to make a rule specific if I need it to be specific and apply only to one element. And if it's not specific enough, I just add it and make it more specific, you know, and uh, until it works and then I feel happy and I move on to the next problem I have to solve. Okay, it's, it's not the official way and, you know, web designers may cringe upon it, but, you know, in practice that's what many people do, okay? So, fine. So, this div and this span are these general containers, one a rectangle, one a span of text that you can style in any way you want, and that's why they are useful. What are the important tags? Um, there is uh, um, titles, which are, I, I think you have seen them already. H1, uh, close H1. And you have uh, uh, up to... Uh, H6, I'm not sure, okay. Um, then there are uh, lists. These are pretty useful, and we have used them already. 
UL, LI, LI, slash UL. And people, many people use lists for things that you would not, nearly, not necessarily expect. For example, uh, you know, you see these uh, elements here um, at the top of this page, eh? these things, home, web to pi. Let's look at what these things are. Whoa, surprise, this is a list. It's a list that they uh, styled so that it's laid out horizontally without bullet points and with a, such a style that they look like entries in a menu. This home, web to pi, et cetera. You see, this is, there is an li element, which is uh, the list item. And then there is uh, the, the link that is the home. So this, this thing, uh, essentially, home, web to pi, and you, could, you can add more to this uh, menu at the top. But this is essentially um, uh, a list that is styled to be horizontal. So lists are very flexible in some way, right? Every time you need a repeated sequence of elements that need to be put one to the side of the other, or, you know, the side being horizontal side or vertical side, sort of, uh, you can use lists, OK? Uh, they're, they're very flexible in that way. If you, if you will, you know, what's the mental organization? If you want one thing next to the other in one dimension, you can use a list and then you can style it appropriately. If you want things to be in a 2D grid, uh, if you really are doing a table, you can do a table, okay? And, uh, and tables are done. Um, I don't have a table here that I can copy from, but tables are done, um, ta tables. Um, I think there is a sort of a table body declaration at the top that is a new thing, right? Am I right? Yeah. Th then there is table and there is uh, the closed table, okay? And then here there is a table row, oh, okay? So this is a row. Let me do a big row. And in the row, the various elements are table data, dot, 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 table data. Uh, or also, if you want, uh, the first one, sometimes you use a th, dot, 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 um, th. Once upon a time, the difference between th and td was important. A th was a table header, um, and td was a table data. So the header was boldface. Now, nowadays, it doesn't matter at all, right? Because uh, you can use td all over the place and simply say td class is equal to header, if you wish, right? So, I mean, they both correspond to rectangular uh, boxes. And if you look into the options, uh, by the way, how do you look into these options? Uh, I do something that, you know, purists incredibly cringe. Uh, I mean, by now you know that I you know, break a lot of rules. But like uh, um, uh, td, um, td, uh, uh, HTML tag, okay, and uh, uh, people say don't look at W3 schools because they don't do things in the official way. But I do a few things in the official way, so you know I've come to sort of give up on, the, on it. Um, and so this gives you all the attributes that you can give to this tag. So if you wonder, you know, how can I make a, my table TD look in a different way? Ah, well, these are the attributes. Oh, great, look. I can see whether the text should align, uh, the content should align to the left, right, center, justified, or these. And it tells me also it's not supported in HTML5. Ah, this is bad. Uh, axis, uh, background color, um, color col column span. You know, what, what do you do if you want to have a table uh, that is uh, a table cell that spans two columns? Well, you know, call span equals two. No? And so, um, so this you can do it for every tag, because the format of a tag is that a tag has attributes. We have seen the class one, okay? But we could also say, for example, call span equals two. So you can have any number of attributes uh, of which class and ID are some. For example, I can have call span is equal to two, uh, class is equal to um, uh, background yellow. Okay, something like this. That's a perfectly fine definition. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I can simply do this. Um, okay, so and if you wonder what is the set of these thingies, the set of these thingies that uh, the, of these attributes uh, that have meaning for a tag depends on the tag. Okay, and uh, 
Uh, it's not maybe the most author authoritative source, but why not? But this gives you essentially a quick guide to what are the, th the attributes that might work. Sorry? Mozilla Developer Network uh, TD tag. Um, voila, let's see. Uh, yes. <coughs> so you can go here and, uh, you know, they're also documented. Great. Oh, yeah, this, this is actually very good. It gives you the browser compatibility. Okay, and actually, this is, a, uh, this is really valuable. So that's a very good suggestion. Okay. Um, so uh, coming back to these, these are lists, these are tables. Once upon a time, uh, when people had to lay out things in, in 2D on a page, so, you know, deciding what goes on top, what goes below, what goes to the left, you know, in a page, you always have a little bit of this layout. For example, you wanted to make a, uh, you know, on the left, you wanted to make a, a list of the pages of the site, and then in the center, you wanted to give the page content. At the bottom, you wanted to give something else, etc. And people in the in the old days used the tables a lot because they said, "Hey, you know, a table lays stuff out in two D, and you know, so let's uh, let's use tables for everything." And then this became really deprecated eh, because. Uh, a table, yes, it lays the stuff out in 2D in a very predictable way, but it's even too predictable in the sense that it's really rather un inflexible, right? So um, once you make a table row, it's always displayed as a row, which you might think is a good idea, but it's not if you then want to easily adapt your page to, say, a mobile device, you know? Um, so nowadays, people rather use tables when they have to present tables. So if you really have to present uh, you know, for example, the grid is implemented as a table because, it, well, it has to look like a table, I guess. Um, but uh, this organization of the site that you have uh, here, um, for example, uh, even even this site, you see, there is something on the left, there's something in the center, something on the uh, something on the left, something in the center, something on the right, and you know, these things I bet are divs. Uh, people nowadays place the content on the page doing many divs. And they, um, they, for example, you, you know, a very good way to think at it is that the page is a blank canvas. And then you start to say, OK, I make a div that I call, uh, I don't know, I can give it an ID that is uh, left, uh, left D, for example, for left div. And I will uh, give it, uh, um, via styling, the fact that this has to be flashed to the left. And it will be on the left, OK? Then I can then do uh, another div that is the container for, uh, uh, I don't know, id is equal to um, main uh, main box, OK? And uh, every, it, everything that I put, want to appear in the center of my website, I will put it as child of this div, OK? And then I can, uh, you know, if I wish, I can, I can uh, put another div that is, you know, uh, that I will style to, to be flash on the right. So and once you're inside of the div of the main box, you can uh, do other things. For example, you have many blog posts. So say you're doing a blog, right? And then every post will be in a div. Now, uh, so, so you know, like when you are with pencil and paper and you want to decide how the site looks like, it's, it's kind of intuitive to draw, draw these boxes with, um, in pencil, no? to say, OK, here you know, will be the sequence of my posts. And, and, and these boxes uh, correspond very naturally to divs, uh, so that if you want to style them, if you want to make, I don't know, look like every blog post is written on, an, on a sheet of uh, ancient paper, then you can style the background of one of these things uh, to look like paper if you wanted. Or, or, you know, I mean, you can, or you can simply decide uh, the margin between uh, different posts, right? Uh, and so, uh, and then, you know, a post will be made probably of, uh, um, of uh, uh, I don't know, three divs, one, uh, one after the other, uh, in which uh, one div will be for the title, one for the body, and the other one for the links, uh, or rather, you know, shaving uh, but buttons, uh, button div, uh, something like that, okay? And once you're at this point, then you start to fill these divs with the real content. You know, that's a very typical way to lay out the site. OK? If you don't say anything, the divs are, are put one below the other. But via styling, you can make them go either you know, one to the side of the other with the space or not. But the beauty of a full thing of using divs is that if I were to adapt this page to a mobile device, 
I could say, for example, that this div, instead of being flash left, that this div goes to the top. Maybe that would be awkward, right? right? Maybe it goes to the bottom, because you want to, if you access from a phone, you actually want to see the posts first, and then this stuff that you have here, I guess. So anyway, that's your decision, you know, but you can change the way they are arranged by just changing styling rather than changing the actual code that, that produces the web page, okay? So that's, uh, that's an idea to keep in mind. Okay, I, I did not fully understand. So you mean it's still written with divs? It's written, but... Uh, but you give them special classes uh, so that uh, they decide whether these are output or not? Uh? Okay. This would be part of outline or not. So outline is uh, when the content is sent. Suppose like when we open anything on Safari, then... Yeah. Uh, Actually, would you like to give at some point a quick presentation about these? Because I don't know it well. And that would be interesting uh, as well. So okay. if... Uh, Okay, okay. Um, by the way, this is uh, for all of you, you know, I don't know everything incredibly well. Um, especially, I don't know, I think I've told you many times the things that regard to visuals incredibly well. I will have a guest lecture, but if any one of you wants to take five minutes to talk about, uh, you know, uh, I give extra credit and I very much appreciate it. So write me some email, okay? Um, Okay, uh, so these are, these are lists, tables. Uh, what are the important other things? So there is images uh, that have a source tag, okay. Um, there, are, uh, um, there are anchors that uh, I uh, have an href, uh, okay, and, and then they close. So um, then there are, you know, form. And form is a complicated thing that I think I have already discussed in part with you and is uh, produced automatically. You know, with, uh, inside it, uh, various, uh, it's produced automatically for us. But the key thing is these input tags that have, uh, that have uh, these important elements that have a value, which is uh, what is shown. Okay. And they have a name is equal to um, var name for web to pi, uh, well, for web to pi or for, for whatever other, um, or whatever other framework you happen to use, of course. But these are the two, these are the two most important uh, attributes of an input field. Um, uh, the form I had described it before, there is action is equal to uh, URL, and there is a method is equal to uh, uh, post. Okay, um, so you want to say where it's sent and how. Okay, and I, I talked about this before. So then there are, you know, there are very many other tags, uh, but I, uh, the, in a sense, there are so many that, you know, I, I'm not sure that I can give you a lecture on all of them. Is there any way, what, what should I mention? What do you think I should mention? Eh? Anything else? Uh, assets, uh, when we are constructing anything which should look appropriately nice, uh, the majority of times they will be covering this. Then there's B, B, R, H, R. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there, there are some on text formatting. Um, text formatting, there is a, uh, a paragraph. Okay, we, and, and it's often, you, I often like to use it because I can add a bit of styling elements to it. Um, B is bold, bold, uh, and strong. Uh, also bold, okay. Uh, and then there is a uh, uh, italics. Uh, or emphasize, uh, yeah, sorry? Oh, as well, yes, I never see I anymore, actually. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, th I think I see mostly used that with M, but I it also works, I guess. And I don't know why, why, what's the preference between B or strong. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think strong is the new way, and B was the old way when people, you know, had uh, you know believed that uh, uh, typing a character was was uh, better than typing five, six. Um, so uh, yeah, these as well, uh, and uh, and I th I think uh, I don't know. Well, anybody else? Uh, Am I omitting say any of the super essential ones? Um, we are in HR. We are in that we are obligated. Um, okay, so BR is like uh, people really don't like it. Okay, but BR is like a force line break, uh, and the other one is <laughs> horizontal rule. But maybe let's not do that. BRs, you know, um, I think they are a bit little bit cringed upon, right? Because uh, you should rather style things with paragraph or uh, divs. Yes. Later, okay, because uh, because I talk about forms because they're mostly generated now. Uh, but, and so uh, I will give you an example. But but the beautiful thing Web to Pi is to force Web to Pi to generate what you want, because you can do very sophisticated things much easier. Um, so let me uh, also tell you one thing. So. This is the HTML. Now, if you want to generate it from Web to Pi, you have two choices. Okay, uh, one is to say this: uh, in the .html file, I can say something like, uh, um, "Let me do a non-trivial example." Okay, I can say that this is a paragraph that I like uh, a href is equal to uh, Web to Pi .com. Okay. Um, HTTP, whatever. Um, so wh why do I do this? I if I just say this uh, without the HTTP, etc., the browser will look for www.webtopi.com on my current website. You know, if I omit uh, this initial portion, it will think that uh, this is a relative URL relative to the page that you are actually viewing. If you are viewing a page that, uh, if you are viewing a page that is in, uh, as here in uh, web HTML element TD, and, and I and I put a link to a page that is simply called the dog.html, the browser will look like uh, for a page that is equal to this, except that here, instead of TD, we'll have dog.html, which you know will not exist. But that's what the browser would look for. So here, if I want to go to another site, sorry, uh, where, where am I going here? Um, if I want to go to another site, I would have to give this, OK? But so href this, so um, uh, web to pi um, a lot, OK? So this is my paragraph. So I can generate it in this way, OK? But the idea is that. Uh, web to pi gives me helpers to help me build pages in code, OK? And so I could also, this, H tag, this A tag here, I can also build it in this way, A. And then as first argument, I have to put what is inside of the tag. In this case, uh, web to pi. No, this is the text that is between the open and then tag, OK? And then I can put with with a with an uh, underscore before, but I can put all the attributes of the tag. So href is equal to um, uh, HTTP. Okay, I can do this. Is this would generate the same thing? And if this had a class, I could simply write here. You know, class is equal to whatever. So you simply put uh, underscore in front of the attribute name and you can do it. For example, let me do this uh, P as if it has a class, like a class uh, is equal to a red, uh, red color. OK? Um, so assume that you want to build this. OK? In web to pi you can build it in this way. So this is the A tag, right? But I can build now a P tag that contains what? It contains I like with the space. I need the space here. Then it, it will contain this a tag. Okay, so you can you put as simply as list of stuff everything that goes inside, and here I need you know a lot. Okay, and then after I put all these elements, I can put the um, 
I can put the attributes. In this case, class is equal to red color. Okay? And I close the parentheses. Okay? So you can generate uh, HTML either in a view or in code. And of course, you know, uh, the, there is a different uh, sort of uh, trade off. There is a tra trade off, right? If the HTML is going to be always the same, you might as well put it in the view so that it's already there and you don't need to run any code to actually produce it. But if you need to produce dynamically some HTML, because the HTML you want to produce depends on whatever else you're doing, it's incredibly handy to be able to produce it in code, right? I can produce the HTML in code and pass it to the view. So I would do something like this, you know? Um, so uh, in, uh, in a Web2Py controller, I can say uh, something like this. Um, my stuff is equal to this. Okay, so, uh, so so you define a variable that is this, and you say return dictionary of my stuff is equal to my stuff. Okay, um, and then in the view, you say um, whatever you need to say, and then you say my stuff, and this would output it. Okay. This works. Now, uh, what does not work? But idea is equal to uh, e hello e. Okay. Um, return dict of uh, um, bad idea is equal to bad idea, okay? And then in the, in, and in the view, I would do bad idea. Let's try a moment how, what this does, okay? So let me take this couple of lines of code here. I will put them inside um, the default controller. It's here, default, uh, no, sorry, this is a view. It's gonna be here. Okay, so here, uh, welcome to Web2Py, and then I, I copy that code, and uh, okay, and now in the, the now in the view that I have here, I um, I put after my, my blue title, I put uh, these. Uh, Bad, bad idea. Okay. So what what happens if I do that? Okay. That we should have uh, the bad idea appear there that is a paragraph. But if I refresh, you see, this, the P is printed as text. Okay. So what happened? I said open tag T, close tag T, and you know, why is it not just interpret it as open and close tag? The reason is this, uh, that if you look at what's, what's happening there, eh? okay, oh boy, did I not click ac accurately where I wanted to look at? I wanted to inspect this element. Yeah, but why doesn't it give it smart in better than this? Eh? This is weird. That's that's not what it's there. It's trying to be too kind to me. Uh, le let me let me in, uh, let me go back to Chrome a moment. Okay, so let me refresh this, uh, and let me see what's uh, there. Let me see whether Chrome is a bit more honest. No, this is not. It's insightable quotes, but this is this is wrong. That's not not at all what the page actually contains. Yeah, if I click on sources, I can see what the page actually contains. No, where where is it? No. Yeah, no, it's here, I guess. So this is a real source of the page. 
And if I look at the real source of the page, that's what's written. Okay, finally something that is honest. Okay, so these uh, these tags here, these tags here have been replaced by. So this is percent lower than. This is a general way in which you can uh, add funny characters into inside HTML. Okay, if you want accents, uh, cedillas, or these kind of things, so you can do it this way. And this is a way that encodes an open brace bracket. Essentially, uh, Web to Pi, when it outputs a variable, it makes sure that it preserves the visual, but it will automatically escape all these kind of brackets. Okay, and this is an extremely important behavior. Okay, uh, is everything clear so far? Eh? So the, the reason why Tupai does this uh, is the following. Suppose I, I decide that I'm a nasty person, um, which I am sometimes. And I do this, I do the following, okay? What is your name, uh, Luca, in this, uh, you know, the MV form? And then I decide that I, my name is actually Luca uh, script. Uh, I don't know, you know, like, uh, a code to dump uh, uh, big uh, secrets uh, um, uh, script. I mean, n not really this, okay? But so I, I, this is called an, an, um, a script injection attack, okay? I give my name as this one. And now you, you claim, but look, at this is silly. Come on. You already have the page in front of you. There is no big secret to be dumped. Uh, you are right. There is no big secret on that page, okay? So suppose that the screen, uh, like, uh, let me be a bit more specific, okay? Code to take the page and email it to Luca. Okay, that's what I really would, uh, could do. I, I mean, not email, but perhaps, you know, you, you, can, you can do code that will give you the information out, okay? Now you say, this is crazy, no? Because I already have the page. I don't need to see the page again. Aha, yes. But I put my name like that. Now, you, you, log, you are a DMV inspector general. I don't know if they're called that way, okay? But you, you are one of these uh, people that, you know, have access to a lot of secret data, you know, like everybody's addresses and whatever else. You know, the DMV has a highly confidential information, I bet, about everybody, right? So now you, uh, and, uh, who are a DMV employee, open and say, you know, let's see who are these people who, I don't know, need to renew the, the driver license in the next six months. You know, suppose I'm one of them, okay? Then my name would pop up. But if my name pops up and this script tag would be left as a script tag, the, the same crazy thing to understand is that once you ship something that contains a script tag to a poor browser, the browser thinks it's really a script and will execute it. I mean, it's not that, you know, oh, but that script tag was not meant to be, no, I mean, the browser is clueless, right? If you send it a name that, con uh, that then contains, if anywhere in the page there is an open script and then the script, uh, what's inside, the two tags will be executed. There is nothing to do with it, okay? So if, if these things were not escaped correctly, when you display the content on, uh, you know, if you are the DMV manager, you display my name as one of the people who has to renew, and then, you know, you would, uh, at that point, uh, the script would uh, be executed and it would email to me all the information that you have on your web page. And your web page may contain wildly more interesting data than my web page when I actually typed in my name. You see? This is called a script injection attack. So, uh, in the web, there are these uh, various categories of dangerous attacks. One is cross-site scripting. We saw this already. It is when you are in one page, and uh, you can cause another parallel tab to guess a URL that will have a side effect. And, and you know, this is something in this page, for example, if something in a Facebook post would cause a URL to, you know, change the forwarding address in Gmail. I mean, this cannot happen because, uh, you know, all these, these URLs that have side effects, as I've taught you, have to use this uh, user, uh, uh, user signature to generate a signature that cannot be easily guessed, okay? But this is category one. Cross-site scripting. Category two that I told you the other time is uh, when you break uh, the escaping that goes into the database. And this is, uh, you know, SQL injection that we talked uh, like a couple of classes ago, okay? Category three uh, is uh, script injection attacks, 
okay, in which you put a script in some input, hoping that some poor chap forgot to escape correctly what is sent to the browser from the data. You see, it's very difficult to do the, the escaping manually because when you write HTML, you don't want to be es escaped, right? When you're inside the view, you want to be able to put stuff that actually have tags. But when you generate it through data by fishing out somebody's name and putting it in, into the view, you need it to be escaped. Otherwise, the per person can just give you a name containing a script and you will be running the script. So per se, it's very difficult to keep things straight. And in fact, you know, this used to be a fantastic way to exploit um, you know, early uh, web apps based on PHP, because in PHP, mostly you had to do this kind of escaping yourself if you were not careful. I mean, it didn't give you like very good tools uh, to distinguish between the two. Uh, in modern uh, frameworks, it's easier, fortunately, because in Web2Pi, the idea is that uh, um, essentially, um, let me put, I mean, this is not a tag, but it's an arrow, okay? But whatever um, you output this way in Web2Pi, is escaped to make um, uh, sure there are no tags. Uh, in particular, this becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, lower than, uh, and this becomes uh, um, uh, greater than. No, these are the fundamental things you have to escape. You can escape other things, but if you escape the open and close the uh, angle brackets, uh, then you know nobody can write a tag anymore, and then basically most most bad behaviors are, are avoided. But you, you can see how you know escaping uh, and quoting are, are the the doom of computer science, right? Because uh, this was not in the design docs of HTML when they invented it. And then you know somebody had to say, you know, oh goodness, this is happening. How do I sabotage it so that uh, it's safe to include content on my web page that somebody else might have input in any other way? And so somebody must have thought, okay. Um, maybe I can escape only the opening and uh, closing tags. Does this work? Yes, no, maybe yes, maybe not. And they have to you know, manually go and see if there is any crazy side effect in any browser that would enable some funny behavior to happen. Very error prone, okay? So in some ways, it's very good that, and it's also very error prone to remember to quote every time, to every time except that Web2Pi does it for you. So there is a way, if you actually want to output uh, without Quoting, okay? There is an XML helper in Web2Pi that you can use. Um, if you pass uh, in XML, I actually, I think we can try it uh, rather than just talk about it. Um, I think that if here, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but let's try, okay? Um, like, uh, uh, this is uh, dangerous, uh, is equal to an XML helper of, uh, um, uh, well, let's uh, use some, uh, some more uh, uh, funny tag, like uh, whatever, like, uh, well, what should I do? Oh, let me do a, a cross-site scripting attack then. Haha, <laughs> nothing better than that, okay? Script, um, alert, uh, you are done, okay? Uh, script, okay? So let me do it in these two sources. No, not your dumb, dumb, but let me do better, you know, I mean, what is a classic, uh, um, you've, uh, uh, or simply, hacked. Okay. so, um, one sec, just one second. So I copy here and I put it also here, okay? Um, Maybe I should change the name from, uh, but I, oh, sorry, this was correct. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So this becomes a good idea. And, and this is dangerous, okay? And so, Something like this. Did I make any obvious error? So let's go into the view. Um, and uh, this was a good idea. So let's try it first of this way, okay? Good idea only. So I, I refresh this page. 
Okay, fine, no bad effect, right? Now let's put in also the, uh, this is dangerous. Okay, so the script was executed and generated this alert. Okay, so this shows you really how easy it is to insert a JavaScript in a page. Okay, so, um, so what did we do in this class as a sort of summary? Yeah, uh, I, I, okay, yes? Isn't there some sort of story about uh, one of the now like head developers of Facebook who hacked Facebook and it's like really early days using an XML class? Um, uh, well, uh, it might be, but I don't know it, but it might very possibly be true. I mean, it's in general very easy in the old days to hack these sites in this way. And in fact, an exercise that I used to do for, uh, well, now that people use web to pie in these classes, it doesn't work so well. But I always included my, uh, you know, when I typed my name or other information in people's websites, I always included like an open script. Uh, um, alert, hack, the uh, close the uh, script, you know? Um, and then I would go and, you know, sooner or later this alert would pop out because, you know, they would forget to escape it in some place or another. Now in Web5 it becomes much harder. But once upon a time it, it was really a, an easy error to make. Why is it such an easy error to make? Because, because of the same reason for SQL injection attacks. If you don't have something that makes it obvious, you know, what makes it obvious in web 2 pi It makes it obvious the fact that this double brace construct, you only use it once. You never use it more than once. You use it once in a view to dump the content of the variable on the web page. So you never wonder, do I have to do it or have I already done it? Because you do exactly once in that moment. That is a real trick. But suppose that instead of having this double brace, you have a, like a similar thing. You have a function that you have to call explicitly that is called the safe quote, for instance. Okay? Now, you have strings and you have to assemble the, the output of the page yourself and you have this function that is called safe quote, says safe quote. And you wonder, when do I call it? Do I need to call it? Because you don't want to call it too often, right? Because it can go into marvelous loops. Uh, I mean, you take this uh, and you quote this, uh, okay? And the, you quote this and this poor thing becomes uh, ampersand. Uh, and then, you know, uh, LT and then the, the uh, same column, you, you know, I mean, you blow up everything, right? You can, uh, every time you quote and quote and quote, uh, and if you quote too many times, you break stuff, right? Because if, if you really have produced some HTML now, if I quote it again, boom, it's not HTML anymore, it's text. So you cannot quote too much, and you have to remember, have I quoted these or have I not quoted these? Do I keep this way? Do I need to do the other way? And sooner or later you mess up, okay? if you do it by hand. And so in Web2Py, these two things together, these braces and these HTML helpers, uh, help you keep it straight. And you know, other frameworks have their own ways of doing similar things. Uh, questions? Any, any other question? I was told I should do a break uh, in the middle of the class sometimes. Would you like a break or not? Okay, let's do a break now and uh, in the meantime, Tell me what you would like me to do in the second part uh, among these various things. Uh. Five minutes though, because uh, we are almost at the end uh, and, and so otherwise. Uh. So my idea is that one of you would volunteer to do a comic sketch uh, in, in the Google Hangout while the other people take a break. Uh. Any volunteers? Are you? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, because I, I don't know what to do with the Hangout. I will just leave it running, I guess. Uh. Sure. But do you know that the comment side or not? I found one, but it doesn't look pretty. No, this is the But uh, uh, the problem is also that some second facts and some second meanings that I'm not even um, I don't think so, but I don't know what it is. You want to have a common text that have a text that you're looking at? Okay, I'll uh, 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 uh
comment is not visible only on this display to the browser, even if you buy the data in the background. But scripts in comments are not executed. Scripts inside comments are not executed. They are comments. All the thing that we check that if the comments are not executed. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I was just wondering if you could explain real quick again. I didn't quite get it. Why you can't just have a string of like a tag and then put that in a dictionary and then surface it? Why is that instead of again? If you need that, you can make me What you were saying for like the bad idea variable? Right? Yeah, because it's if like you a string. Do that, it's not working. No, if you write it on the command line, it's fine. So doing doing uh, uh, doing like uh, uh, s is equal to this is okay, right? Because you know what you have written here. Mm -hmm. But suppose you write something else, like s is equal to db uh, we uh, select uh, first uh, uh, name. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you write something like this, you don't know what the name will contain. Mm -hmm. If you shoot it out without quoting, then the if the name contains a script, you are just putting a script on the web page. So, what do you mean shoot it out without quoting? Because isn't it important what the what the input is rather than what the output is? No. Because you know, I should be able to have a name that is arbitrary. Right. I could come from a funny country in which you know uh, my name is uh, uh, my name is really it could be really the sort of uh, uh, script uh, Earl of uh, uh, somewhere in here. Okay. I mean, you know, it, uh, in this case, no. But suppose suppose I, I'm designing a database in which people share coding examples. Yeah. Script might be a perfectly good part of the input. You cannot really prevent that from the input. It's not, not a very good thing to do. What you can do is instead you can quote it on the way to the screen so that it displays in a way that reproduces the content, but it does not interfere with the, the interpretation of the web page. That's, that's more the idea that is used. No, yeah, you're right in the sense that, you know, there is an input phase and an output phase. You have to quote one of the two. Which one of the two? And so you're asking a really good question. But the tradition is to quote on the way out. Okay. Not on the way in. But what if someone enters a malicious script, it goes straight to the query, and then you know you get a result, and then you quote that, is what you're saying? Yeah. So what if you're just quoting some sensitive information? No, but because the sensitive information would already be in. And that's fine. You know, I cannot prevent somebody from putting in sensitive information and then it coming out back out. If I call my if I Enter in a yes. database. My name is Luca, and by the way, the safe, uh, the code for opening the safe is one two three four. You know, <laughs> then that will be displayed when somebody looks at my name. Okay, I see. That fine. I was I was saying more of like the query that's take that's getting a lot of like uh, different users results, something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's right. I mean, you have to be very careful in designing websites so that you don't don't, don't give out too much information. Mm -hmm. Got you. Any questions? No. Okay. So should should I should I begin again? Um, uh, so actually, uh, I want to start from his questions because they were uh, re really uh, interesting. So he asked essentially, why do you quote on the way out, you know, from the content to the to the screen, if you will? rather than on the way in. You know, you could also quote everything that goes into the database. Um, what is the perfect answer? Uh, I mean, one answer is that everybody does it this way. Um, but uh, why do they do it this way? In a, in a sense, because, you know, maybe the web is not your only output. So that might be one reason. Suppose you are, uh, we are de developing a site in which people can share code samples. You know, I want to get your code as it is, and your code might include the script tags. 
And you know, I want to be, you do you to be able to maybe click on a button and download the code directly as it was input. And then when I display it, I just quote it in such a way that it displays fine, and but but the script tags and the other tags are just displayed and are not interpreted. Okay. Now, of course, I could also store it in the database quoted, and when you click on the download button, I could re unquote it, right? Uh, and this tells you why, why quoting is the bane of computer science in part, right? Because it's so arbitrary what you do and, you know, it's so messy to get it uh, and it's so easy to get it wrong. So I think there is a lot of value in actually sticking to the traditional thing. You know, you put in the database the truth and you quote it on the way out. Because if you do that, the tools help you and it's easier to, to keep it straight. Okay, I think that's part of the answer. There are many things that in theory could work. But in practice, if you do the standard thing, uh, you will get it right much more often, I guess. Uh, does anybody have a better reply? No, OK. Um, OK, um, what did I want to do? The fact is that there is, a, there is not a lot of time to do any of the other things I, uh, wanted to do. Maybe I should talk about the grid a little bit. Um, and then instead next time I will talk better about input, output, uh, and validation, which is a longer topic. Yeah? Uh, can I just ask So how do you change, uh, uh, can you make the grid change according to parameters? So you, you make it editable if you get in in a certain way, but not if you get in in another way, for well, instance. No, no, like when you make it editable, like it'll produce an edit button, but then when you click it, that doesn't seem to take you to another page, but uh, I'm not too sure what it's doing. Yes, it takes you to an, in the grid is a complicated object that Contains internal. Let me let me do an example, okay? And and then ask, ask me again, though, if, if if this does not work. So I I will go into uh, what's the easiest way. Um, I think the B board had in the controllers uh, some code that that contained a grid, right? Just to be fast. So. Just because I want to get a grid without any effort, okay? So, so, so this was called B board, and it was index two. So let me just call up that page, so that we can see. Um, Okay, and this was index two. So, so this was the table we defined, uh, the grid we defined. Now. This this uh, um, this edit button we put it in. Let me put in an edit button that comes with a view to discuss what what it does. Okay, so this is uh, the the product, the thing, and so I, I turn editable to true. Okay, so I turn editable to true. I reload this thing. Now I get well, sorry. I thought I saved it. Oh. Yeah, but why? I mean, uh, if I say editable is equal to true, it should be editable even if I'm not logged in, I guess. Bizarre. OK. Um, I think it might be if I do this. Uh, Let me try this, uh, just out of curiosity. Ah, I knew it. This is Massimo being uh, smart. Uh, so the point is this, editing is dangerous. So by default, the button to edit comes with a user signature to avoid somebody that does not have the right to edit to click on it, okay? If in the declaration of the table I put user signature is equal to false, so this button edit is simply a is simply a poor button edit that doesn't come with a user signature. 
Let me log in to show you the difference. And then you can produce it even when I'm not logged in. Let me log in to show you the difference. Now I'm logged in. Look at this edit button. It's written small at the bottom, okay? But if I click on it, you see the URL is edit bboard2, okay? Massimo does it in a way, I, I don't know whether actually he did it, you know, it might have been somebody, I, I think he did, but, but I mean, multiple people developed this uh, Web2Pi. But if I do this way, did I save it? Yes. If I do it this way, the edit button comes with this long signature. So this is one thing to, to, to notice. In, in grids, they sign the buttons that, that can be vaguely dangerous. In truth, you wonder, you know, but an edit button does not have any side effect. It's when you click the submit of the edit that you actually have a side effect. So why do they put the signature? I don't know, okay? At some point, uh, you know, they felt safer, and I don't know. I can ask him the reason, uh, but, uh, but I don't know. Um, there is no danger if you do this, uh, but... Uh, okay, I will be frank. I really don't know. I fought with it other times in which I did not expect it. Uh, I think there is some uh, strange side condition in which otherwise people would have been able to maybe get information that they should not have been able to get. That's the answer. Okay, so um, now suppose, now I want you to look at one thing. Look at this URL. It contains bboard default index 2, application controller, application file controller. Then there are sometimes three arguments, edit bboard one. One is the action to do, the second is the table to use, and the third one is the ID inside of the table, okay? So one question that I often uh, have from you is this. How do I distinguish, professor, if I am in this view or if I am in one of these views? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I like the ringtones that are the most possibly surprising. So, uh, how do you distinguish if you are in the main view, uh, or if you are, let me put it actually on silent though, uh, because he, for sure he will try to call me again, is <laughs> my, my colleague Manfred. Um, so, uh, so I can click on view, or I can click on edit, right? Um, if I'm here, I can count that there is uh, no argument, and if I'm here, I have three arguments. So, so suppose I want to do something uh, like, uh, um, like what? For example, I'm okay with the downloading when I'm here. No, I don't know what to do. Um, like, uh, well, give me some idea. What can I want to do that is different if I'm in a, in a small view or not? Um, yeah, okay. Um, that's a good idea. So. Uh, for example, I can say, uh, if len, oh, I can do it here, actually, you see? This is code that was special already. Um, I can say, um, like, title is equal to uh, detail view, okay? And here I can say, title is equal to uh, main page, okay? And you see, this will be active when the request arcs is equal to zero, okay? Um, and then I can say title is equal to title, uh, okay? And if I go in an, uh, in uh, in index two in the views here, um, um, so okay, um, I can say that this uh, should display the title, okay? Okay, now it says main page. If I go here, it says detail view. Okay, very simple to do. Now, a very important thing is this, and this is many people ask in the homework. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is, uh, suppose you want to pass some additional parameter to this uh, grid, to this page, so that it behaves in two different ways. How to do it? There are two ways, okay? Suppose that really here I have some other parameter. Uh, I can either say, you know, my parameter is equal to request.arts.zero. Now, what is the problem if you do this? The problem is that if you do this, you are taking the first argument for, itself, for yourself. But the grid view 
will uh, still expect whenever you go into edit mode or view mode that it's three parameters are what it has to do view or edit the table name and the id of the record right uh, this is what uh, the, the it expects and so what you think is your first pa first parameter first argument will be read by the grid the grid will throw in a conniption and it will say not authorized because it doesn't know what to do basically it will receive a strange thing as what it has to do and it will uh, you know fail okay uh, so there is a way to if you want to do this uh, aside from the fact that, that we will have to change this code for the title okay but there is a way to fix it by saying here eh, and and I give it in in some homework notes as well uh, okay there is a uh, um, args is equal to and I have to say that I forget but is I think is a request args from more uh, something like this I think I wrote it correctly in the homework yes Yes, when the browser gets a request, okay, um, let me let, let me put it actually here a moment uh, at the bottom, okay? So um, so Im imagine that I call your website with uh, um, site, uh, so, sorry, app. Uh, file controller okay and then there is arg0 arg1 arg2 uh, and then there may be a question mark v, uh, var1 is equal to val1 um, and uh, var2 uh, is equal to val2 okay so this is a, uh, then re request arx.0 is arg zero and so on okay and moreover um, request dot vars dot var one is val one and so on so essentially the request object which is described in the web to pi uh, uh, how it is called I think it's chapter four uh, the core it's called the core the chapter um, it contains a description of this request object. There are two objects that are available to you all the time in uh, Web2Py. One is the request object, and the other one is the response object. The request object contains a lot of stuff um, that depends on, on the that comes uh, depends on the request. For example, there look in the details if you are interested. But you can find, for example, what host name was used in the URL that caused the request. You know, normally your application is given only the URL, but if you want to know also what host name, because you could be putting your app, the same app running on, a, on multiple websites if you wanted, right? So you can recover it from there. Um, suppose you want to know, hey, did the person use HTTPS or HTTP? Well, you can find it there. Suppose you, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Everything that you may wonder, like what, can, what was the, the browser um, used? No, you, you see, know that the browsers send out these, uh, how it is called, the, the name escapes me. But they send these uh, user, uh, user agent, thank you. They send the user agent. Where do you find the user agent? Well, in the request object somewhere, uh, you can look at the description. Actually, I can show you where it is, okay? So that uh, you see how to look for, for yourself. So, web to pi book. Um, Okay, and in chapter four, the core. Okay, uh, this is probably you should read it uh, at some point, not in detail, but you should know what is in there. And uh, the request object is described here. Okay, and these are all the various stuff it has: a request environment, request application, request controller, function, extension, yada yada, these, that, and something else. But these are the variables. Okay, and these are the arguments, and these are by far the two most useful things. Okay, because they give you access essentially to the pieces that were given to you in the URL. And you know, symmetrically in Web2Py, uh, if you want to uh, build a URL, you can say URL uh, controller, uh, no, sorry, file controller, okay. Uh, and then you can say args 
is equal to uh, arg 0, arg 1, arg, arg 2. And then you can say um, vars is, is equal to the variables of a dictionary, right? So you say dictionary of var1 is equal to val1, uh, var2 is equal to val2. Okay? Something like this. So, so this is, uh, you know, the, the most handy way to, to pass things back and forth, right? Between, uh, bit. and uh, uh, now the question is, is it better to use arguments or variables? And these I commented last time. Arguments are better when you're sure that they are always there. If something is always there, you might as well use an argument because then, you know, it's there easier to fish out. Uh, give me the arguments 0, 1, and 2, and you, de you decide in which order. And my habit is when I write a controller, uh, in the comment that comes at the top of the controller, I would always use one of these uh, um, comments to say uh, uh, arg zero so, uh, or arguments, uh, no? And I, I, and I would uh, explain what the arguments actually are, okay? So that when I need to go there from, from with a URL from some other page, I actually know what to pass in which order if I'm passing arguments, okay? Variables are better when they are uh, optional they might be there or not because variables uh, being a dictionary they don't uh, take up space if they are not there and you can just check whether they are there or not so suppose we want to make this index behave in two different ways according to whether we have or not have a special variable okay and uh, my variable will be um, so just to continue the example okay i want these uh, to be um like uh, Suppose I want to say title is equal to default view. I remove this line. And so if I don't say anything, the title is equal to this. OK, but then I want to say that um, title can be overridden. And I can say if request.vars.title this checks if this has uh, been assigned a value. And then I can say title is equal to request dot verse dot title. Why does this crazy stuff work? Okay. It's because request dot verse is a dictionary, but it's a dictionary that was implemented in a nifty way in Python. And if you want, I can tell you the code that was used. Okay. But it's a dictionary such that it has two funny things that are special. It can access with a dot notation, which makes your code look better. It would also work if I wrote this, OK? But it wouldn't quite work. This would kind of work, ex except that if title was not in the request virus, this would crash. Because you know when you access a dictionary with an element that is not there, it crashes. Instead, this nifty thing that has been invented in Python, and I can show you the code, is five lines of very elegant code. But this thing that was invented is a sort of you know, fail-safe dictionary. You can access with dot notation, and if the thing is not there, instead of failing, it returns none, which is the Python for you know, nothing. So these lines of code are interpreted in this way. Hey, if a request verse title was assigned a value that was not none, and any value is not none, it's going to be a string, right? Uh, variables and uh, arguments are, are strings, unless you know, other things uh, happen. So if there was some title defined, use it as my title, OK? Um, this may, may or may not be a great idea. But fortunately, you know, we are saved by um, Web2Py escaping, because otherwise you could play some incredibly nasty attacks, OK? Um, so let's, uh, let's try this code. Sorry, I am getting lost in my many windows. But now, if you're here, let, let me first check that everything still works. Yes. Um, now, I can say, sorry, I have to save, eh? Yeah. No, what? No, I, I, I didn't save it. Okay, I forgot to save it. Now, let me inject that variable here. So title is equal to, um, like, hello, uh, okay? So let me load this page. Boom. Uh, great. Now I can say also crazy stuff like title is equal to script uh, boo uh, script. Okay. Now in this case, uh, okay. 
Oh, I hit reload. I'm sorry. Um, alert, uh, then I do it really. Uh, ha. Um, script. Okay, so I can, I can, nothing prevents me from doing this. Um, okay, I would have had to quote to the same, but, but you see, the quoting prevents this from working, basically. Okay, um, now this tells you one thing, however, uh, that the golden rule of uh, development, then I stop for now, okay, but the golden rule of development is this. Anything in a form, anything in a request.vars, anything in an argument, you have to assume that it can contain malicious stuff. So it's very different from a programming, from writing a normal program. Here, these things look like variables that are passed to you in a benevolent way, but they are not. So if I were not quoting these or trusting any information, suppose that you do a method that, that you know, if, if I give it a certain parameter, then it will behave in a way. Anybody can give that parameter, okay? And this is very hard to guess. So, um, you know, if, if you trust that what is uh, put as URL parameters will be put in the database, be extremely careful. You have to validate it each time eh, because it can be completely manufactured in a, in a, in a malicious way, okay? So, and ne next time, actually, I will talk more about validation and input output. I think uh, this time I only talked uh, um, a bit about this. Uh, is there need for more on grid next time? Uh, maybe yes, right? Are there other subtleties of grids that I need to explain? If so, write to me and I'll prepare something for next time. Otherwise, I will move on on uh, form and validation.